Triumph Stack Day. Talk about calling systems today. Uh, the nemesis of the Triumph V8, apparently. Anyway, um, please subscribe if you like this kind of stuff. Give me a thumbs up, give me a thumbs down, etc. etc. Contact me, Church House Classics. It's all one word at gmail.com. Um, and uh, yeah, enjoy the video. Here it is, Triumph V8. This is in my stag, uh, this one. <laughs> no apologies for the dirt. It's not been washed in a fair while. Um, it needs a damn good clean. Uh, its body restoration happened a few years ago now. It's holding out nicely. Anyway, cooling system on my stag. I've had some issues with it. Of course you have everyone shouting at their screens. Um, but uh, they're not necessarily that bad. Uh, and I think that when the system is working as it was designed... Um, it is, uh, it's marginal, let's say, so it shouldn't overheat, put it that way. Uh, now, this system is pretty much standard. It's got the viscous fan, um, and it's got the standard water pump down here, um, and the only addition is that I've put a high-level expansion tank in, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Oh, goody, I hear you all shouting. It's a fairly standard cooling system. Um, let's go around to the other side of the car. Bob's chassis in the way there. Um, so basically, fairly standard cooling system. You've got the, the thermostat is hidden underneath the, the um, air filter here. Feeds into the top hose. Obviously goes through the radiator with a viscous fan in the middle of it all. Sucks it back into the water pump via the bottom hose. Nothing particularly nasty about it. The temperature sender, slightly unusually, so rather than the temperature sender being up near the thermostat, is actually at the back of the left hand head and that's where the temperature gauge is attached now i've actually got a, um, a mechanical temp gauge on this thing uh, and there's a reason why i had a mechanical temp gauge on this car so let's have a chat about the problems i've had with my stag first of all i'll relocate where do i start with the stag well first of all i start to get myself in the middle of the frame couldn't i there we go that's a bit better how about that there you go got my hat hard on on everything um so yeah my stag um engine um when i first got it decades ago um, it had a nasty habit of running quite warm at most race speeds back then it had an automatic gearbox um, and a bw35 a board warner 35 gearbox um, and it at motorway speeds the, the temperature gauge would be up against the red on the on the temperature gauge on the traditional temperature gauge which was concerning me because obviously you know the stag's reputation precedes it. it yeah everyone knows that stags overheat i mean any any chap at the pub will tell you that all stags oh yeah they overheat don't they um they don't really um in fact in the 20 something years i've owned my stag it's only ever overheated once and i'll go into that in a second um so i found the root cause of the original overheating was actually the wrong thermostat had been fitted now there are uh, two different types of thermostat. You get your traditional thermostat, which just goes into a hole on an inlet manifold, and that's what it does. The stag, however, certainly the Mark II stag, has got a bypass, which allows the uh, coolant to travel around internally within the engine, so it circulates, uh, still using the water pump. Um, and um, obviously, it's going to need to do that before the thermostat opens, otherwise the thing's going to overheat. I had the wrong thermostat in mine. Um, so even when the thermostat was closed, uh, the bypass was open and when it was open the bypass was open so it's important to make sure you've got the right thermostat in your stag second thing that i found quite early on in my ownership and we're going back decades this isn't last week um second thing i found out was that the temperature gauge and also the fuel uh, level gauge on the dashboard i mean okay <sighs> gauges on your dashboard are largely there to indicate that the gauge is functioning I know it's a nasty thing to say, but don't believe everything the gauges tell you. Because more often than not, they're pathological liars. Uh, that's why I fitted a mechanical um, water temperature gauge, and we'll go into that shortly. So my um, temperature gauge on my stag was misbehaving. So we found out that the temperature, or I found out, via Tony Hart, I think, when he was running HRS racing, I used to visit him fairly regularly with little anomalies on my stag. But one of the things that he checked for was that the earth lead was on the back of the instrument pod where the uh, the, the uh, voltage regulator is, voltage stabiliser is. So both the um, standard water temperature gauge and the uh, standard fuel uh, level gauge 
both rely a standard voltage. Now, if you imagine when your car's not running, the ignition's off, your battery will be 12.2 to 12.8 volts resting. As soon as you start your engine, your voltage jumps to about 13 and a half, well, 13.6 or thereabouts, because the alternator puts um, charge into the into the into the um, loom, providing, of course, all the smoke hasn't leaked out of it first. Um, now, the voltage stabilizer's job is to regulate the voltage. I think it's nearer nine volts. It, 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 so it takes whatever voltage the car is throwing at it when the engine's running, and it regulates that down to a fixed voltage. Now, the voltage goes to the gauge, and then it earths through the sender, and the sender earths by uh, varying resistances. That's for the temperature sender, not the fuel tank sender. So the temperature sender is, is, is the earth point for the gauge. Now... The voltage stabiliser will only work if it's earthed to the body earth. In a stag, you've got a nice wooden dashboard. Oh yes, very nice. Uh, however, it's not very good at conducting electricity. Well, unless a lightning bolt strikes it, in which case it's very good at uh, conducting electricity. But then that's extremely high voltages. Not, we're not talking 12 volts anymore. Um, so uh, one of the first things to do when you find that your temperature gauge or your fuel gauge is overreading is to actually just double check that there is an earth lead still attached to the back of the speedo. I think it's a speedo. Give me one second. Attached to the back of whatever gauge the voltage stabiliser is attached to. And here's a picture of what it looks like. So that caused the gauge to overread a little bit. Um, and that did resolve that problem. Um, so, so then my stag chundled on quite happily for a number of years, um, behaving itself. Um, one of the... I won't go through the flaws of the system. I'll cover that when I'm actually looking at the engine. But if I go through my history of the car. So it would still run a little bit warm at motorway speeds. Um, not hot. Um, and the general consensus was, using my um, infrared th thermometer jobby, not for internal use apparently i don't know it's written for someone i don't know who though um the general consensus was that it wasn't actually overheating and that really uh kind of maybe it was a false positive reading on on on, on, the, on the, the you know on the gauge i did fit a mechanical gauge and it indicated that the car was running somewhere between 90 and 105 degrees which the general consensus would appear to be is about right for a stag with a 20 pound cap on it um, so the status quo remained normal for many, many, many years until I went through a body restoration in, and I think it was 2007, correct me if I'm wrong, Richard. As part of the body restoration, um, I replaced my automatic gearbox, which was failing quite rapidly. Um, it was a BW35. Uh, it was making a whirring noise um, when at idle when the, um, the kickdown cable was attached to the carburetors, and the general consensus was your pump is on its way out. And when the pump lets go on an automatic gearbox, then there's no hydraulic pressure inside the automatic gearbox and therefore it ain't going to go anywhere. So I looked at getting that box rebuilt um, and uh, yeah, it didn't happen. It was just too damn expensive. And I ended up buying a complete uh, manual overdrive um, setup uh, with a J-type overdrive from a, a chap who used to break um, uh, stacks. Hello, Martin. Um, used to break stacks, um, and uh, yeah, I bought a complete gearbox from him, all the trimmings and the bits and bobs, and I fitted that. Marvellous. Uh, one of the things that I did have to remove from the car, though, was the uh, the rather crunched up automatic gearbox cooler, which sat right underneath the viscous fan at the bottom of the radiator. Now, the first thing I noticed after doing that was that the cooling system was now all of a sudden far too efficient like massively efficient uh, and rather than running halfway at the gauge it was now running a third of the way at the gauge and at motorway speeds it was running just over halfway rather than three quarters um, so part of me was thinking well perhaps the excess heat from my crunched up automatic gearbox cooler and all the vanes were properly crunched up on it um, perhaps that was um, putting a little bit too much heat in between the radiator and the uh, viscous fan so perhaps the viscous fan was then circulating more hot air than around the engine bay than it needed to. But that's aside. Anyway, the, 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 good, the good thing was that the car's now running cooler than it used to by putting a manual overdrive gearbox in it. Whoa, look at that. So fast forward a fair few years, um, I went to Bromley Pageant of Motoring. Brilliant. Thanks, Ian, for getting me the invite for that. Really do. Um, it was, uh, yeah, 
I stopped going to Bromley Pageant and Motoring a fair few years ago. In fact, the last time I went prior to this occasion was actually I signed, I signed up to the Stag Owners Club. But one of the things about the Bromley Pageant and Motoring is the hours of traffic that you sit in in order to get in. And I'm not kidding here. It's not funny. Bromley, fucking do something about it. Anyway, on this particular occasion, more recently, um, I was in the Stag. Um, Ian had set up on behalf of Stag Owners Club, South East London group, I think it was, correct me if I'm wrong, Ian, um, had set up um, a stand and I was invited. Thank you very much. Um, the idea was we were supposed to enter via the back gate uh, and uh, uh, the stand was, the stag stand was right beside the back gate. So we all queued up at the back gate and were turned around by uh, someone that basically hadn't been told that we were all supposed to be coming in the back gate. I'm not going to say any more than that. So we then thought, fuck it. So we turned around, got into the queue, getting into the queue to enter Bromley Pageant and Motoring, which then was, was, was the entrance queue at the head of was staffed by volunteers who were not very quick at processing each vehicle coming in. So I sat in that queue for over two hours with the engine at idle. Now, one of the problems with a car, when a car starts running a little bit warmer than perhaps it should do, you really don't want to be turning the engine off. Because when you turn the engine off, the mechanical water pump is no longer turning. Mechanical water pump's no longer turning. You're going to get hot spots building up inside the engine with all that heat that's sitting there in the cylinders are being captured by the coolant. So I opted to keep the engine running. Now, all was well for the first hour and 45 minutes of the engine idling and creeping forwards because... Being a manual overdrive car now, um, the car needs to be at about, I think it's just over 10 miles an hour in first gear with the clutch up, fully up, before the clutch can be completely disengaged. So kind of like every time a gap opened up in the traffic, it's just a case of bringing the clutch up, slipping it to pull forwards three feet and then putting the clutch back down again, knocking it back into neutral. Um, the idle speed on my car is about 650 RPM, which is probably a little bit low for the water pump. It's one of the flaws in the water pump that it, no water pump's really going to operate at low revs like that. So if you want your water pump to operate a bit more efficiently, you need to turn the idle speed up. I didn't bother. The, the, the temperature gauge was reading just over the half. And I thought, well, this is OK. It's not too much of a problem. Um, and it just sat there for ages and ages and ages. And then all of a sudden, the gauge went from half to just underneath the red. And I thought, oh, holy fuck, what's going on here? Because it's with anything on these gauges you're looking for a change in normal behaviour, a change in pattern. It doesn't matter what the gauge is reading, but if you suddenly get a change in the normal pattern, then you need to investigate. Lifted the bonnet up, couldn't see any leaks, all the coolants in the system still, couldn't see what was going on, but the gauge had literally just moved across. So I darn it all. I wonder what that's all about. Queued another oh, fucking eternity and eventually got to the front entrance where there was um, some volunteers that very, very casually processed my application uh, to actually get into the show. I know it's the number one reason why I will never go to Bromley Pageant and Motoring again. Because it's just a fucking nightmare getting in and out of the place, guys. Anyway, got in um, and parked the car up and lifted the body up and it wasn't overheating and it wasn't going tick or whiz or whir or anything. It didn't seem to be anything other than a car that had been sitting there idling for two and a half hours. So I assumed, well, I don't know, maybe it's a false positive. Maybe the uh, the uh, thermostat's failed, maybe the uh, voltage stabilizers failed, I don't know. So I drove the car home. Uh, one of the changes in behavior when I was driving home, in less traffic, when I was driving at 30, 40 miles an hour and onto the motorway at 70, 80 miles an hour, blah, 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 was that the gauge was now permanently reading on the edge of the red. Um, I had already checked while I was at the show um, that there was an earth and it was still there. I didn't have all my tools with me, but I did have a uh, multimeter. So I checked the continuity from the back of the voltage stabilizer, and yes, it read straight to earth. So that's good, so it was earthed. Um, there was a couple of um, um, auto jumblers there, but no one had a voltage stabler, like stabilizer, no one had a temp sender. So, all right, bollocks to it, I'll get home. So I drove it home. The temperature gauge didn't do anything other than sit at the red, and I was a little bit concerned while I was belting around the M25, and it was a kind of Sunday afternoon belting round the M25, thinking when I come to a stop, traditionally the gauge would have crept up a little bit because you, again, you come into a stop, the idle speed's low, 
um, uh, the water pump suddenly stops pumping huge volumes of coolant around the engine and you get hot spots in the engine which causes the temperature to rise quite rapidly as you stop normal behaviour. Um, and I was getting a bit worried about this. I thought, well, perhaps I, I ought to give it kind of a gentle run up towards Junction 2 Beaconsfield on the M40. Give it a gentle run towards there and it will give it a fighting chance. Um, at the end of it, no drama. Got to Junction 2. The gauge didn't move any further. And all this time I'm diagnosing it, thinking, yeah, gauge is either gauge, sender or voltage stabiliser is dead. Something's gone wrong here. The fuel gauge was reading accurately, though. Or so I believed. I think it was. Anyway, so got it home. No problems at all. Ordered up thermostat, ordered up a new temp sender, uh, ordered up this, that and the other, blah, 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 blah. I fitted all those bits because the following week I was driving to Le Mans. Great. Used to love big boys Le Mans. Not, not the classic, no, the big boys Le Mans. Um, and taking the stag with me. Um, so I changed all this stuff, put an extra earth onto the voltage stabiliser and it appeared to be behaving better. But now I had a slightly different problem in that it was running very, very hot at motorway speeds, like up against the red. But anything other than motorway speeds, the temperature dropped. So a slightly different problem. Um, and I'm thinking, I don't really understand this. Got hold of the viscous fan, gave it a spin, seemed all right. Couldn't really spin it that far because the rad and everything was in the way. So I drove to Le Mans, uh, went down to my mate's house, Adrian, hello Adrian, picked him up um, the night before, so kept in his, kept in his front room, because uh, we were leaving at Sparrow's Fart to get on the ferry the next morning. Um, and uh, yeah, the car was kind of at motorway speed, just running up against the red, this is a pain in the ass. I'm getting really fed up with this. So <clears throat> next morning, off we go, set off down towards um, uh, Dover. I think we went on the channel, doesn't matter. Anyway, it sort of ran up against the red at anything at motorway speed, slowed down to let's say about two to two and a half thousand RPM, um, and it behaved itself. So the temperature started to drop. But as soon as you went to three thousand RPM, the temp temperature rose quite rapidly, uh, but didn't go past the red. So I was going to be irritated by all this shit. So we got into France, and of course the weather starts, you know, getting warmer. Nice blue clouds in the sky. The weather's getting warmer and warmer and warmer, and we got just to about Rua, no disasters yet, but the temperature gauge, um, it's starting to annoy me now, it's spoiling my drive. So we decided to stop for a fuel break and I thought, you know what lads, I'm gonna have a quick look at this thing. We're gonna do a quick bit of diagnosis here. So one of the things I, I wanted to check was the vacuum advance was working on the distributor. So pulled the pipe off, gave the um, gave the um, distributor, uh, gave the pipe a big old suck. Back then I had a Piranha P8 um, um, optic system. And the problem was that when I sucked on the vacuum advance, the optic wasn't actually moving. Right, okay, but I wasn't drawing breath through it, but nor was the optic moving. So I thought, okay, there's something odd here. So we took the base plate out uh, to have a look at that um, and found that the optic had actually carved its own groove into the base plate. It's old, I mean, it's been on the car for 20 years. Um, so we loosened the screws on that a little bit to get it moving a bit freer. Um, checked the bob weights, were in the bottom of the distributor and found a whole load of little bits of black debris um, from the insides of various cheap rotor caps, so distributor caps that I've put on over the years. Those little lumps of plastic, I thought, well, maybe they're blocking up the mechanical advance in the distributor. So pulled all those out, put it all back together again, set off, temperature, bang in the middle. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Yay, big, you know, congratulations. Here we go, fantastic, happy days. And about 10 miles later, fucking temperature's up against the red again. Fucking car. Drove all the way through Rouen, with the temperature nudging the red. And it's not a very comfortable thing to believe. And this is where I come, come, come to the um, the statement of, you know, the gauge is doing nothing other than reporting what the gauge thinks it should be reporting. It's not necessarily accurate. And this is why I put the mechanical gauge in again. Uh, but it was still running the electrical gauge at that time. So um, we got, we kept stopping for fuel and I, I I did discover that when the car was running at two and a half thousand RPM or below, um, the, the gauge would start to drop. Um, and if the car was running at above um, uh, two and a half thousand and, and, and let's say, you know, 70 to 80 miles an hour, we're talking three to three and a half thousand RPM, then the temperature gauge would be running up against the red. So I thought, sod it, we'll just drive a little bit slower and we'll get down there, we'll diagnose it when we get there because I'm bored of this by this point. Um, I am bored of just looking at this, this temperature gauge. In fact, I probably should just put a piece of duct tape over the top of it and ignore the fucking thing. Um, we got to the payage exit at Le Mans, North Le Mans, 
and there was some twat sorting through all these fucking loose change trying to work out what was pennies and what was son teams while he was paying the bills so there was an enormous queue for the two booths um and mike gage insert picture here Look like that. Now, that's not very friendly, is it? Really not very friendly. So we carried on. We drove to, um, we, well, we went to go and pick up beer and supplies, which is important, you know. So we picked up all the beer and supplies. Again, no, no sign this thing was overheating at all. So I just, I, I got to the point where, fuck it, I'm going to ignore it. <laughs> so we got um, loaded up with all the beer, the bread, God knows what else. There was a whole group of us, and by which time, of course, like, you know, everyone's laughing at me with my triumph snag and the bloody cooling system because I was it, was it was irritating me and then we set off and we were in Arnage at the time so we thought well we're going to so-and-so campsite and the road down there was absolutely rammed so I thought okay let's forget about this let's, let's go back round and join in to the to go to go to the grandstand well this kind of coincided with you know Thursday night rush hour at Le Mans and Everyone was turning up at Le Mans and we sat in traffic for nearly two hours queuing to get on to, uh, get, well, basically queuing to get on to the, uh, the kind of the end road, blah, 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 that goes down towards the, 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 uh, the, the entrance to Le Mans. And the whole fucking time, the gauge is just like sitting on the edge of the red and then it creeped into the red and I thought, oh, I've had enough of this. I'm just going to ignore it. And it sat in the red sector at idle for about 45 minutes, but didn't move. And it didn't feel particularly hot. Lifted up the bonnet, no sign that the, yeah, the hoses were anything other than normal pressure. So I just ignored it and carried on sitting in this fucking traffic. Anyway, we, we kind of like, we were metres away from getting onto the road. And then all of a sudden I just saw a wisp of steam coming out from the corner of the bonnet where the, um, the, the, the um, expansion tank is. I switched off immediately. Fuck it. It was at the side of the road anyway. So fuck it, lifted up the bonnet. I had a big piece of carpet in the boots. So I put that over the top of the uh, the rag cap and I released the pressure on the system. Um, and I mean, an incredible amount of water came out, but it it didn't boil for long. It only just tipped that open. I mean, that, that gauge had been in the red for yonks. So I, I, I'm fairly convinced that, you know, I'm fairly convinced of nothing really. I'm sick to death of the fucking thing by that point. So we filled it up with, uh, with bottled water that we had just bought. I drove to the campsite, which took about another hour and eventually kind of got into the campsite and I just parked the car, fuck it, get me a beer. Didn't even bother putting the roof, just fucking car. Turned me back on it, sat there, ignoring it for the rest of the day. Anyway, a couple of the lads were there and we, we were kind of looking around. Well, they were looking around it and I was ignoring it. So it didn't seem like it's that hot and the cooling system's still full and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so kind of, I don't know, this next morning, curiosity got the better of me. Perhaps I should be nicer to my stag. So we pulled the rad out. And check the check the flow on the rad. Now there was a whole load of Turkish delight in the rad, and I'm pretty sure that that shit was steel seal. I can't remember the name of the product. It's one of those kind of products that you lob into the radiator to cure your head gasket, guaranteed. And I've thrown it in there years before. Now I back flush my cooling system every year, and I've never seen that shit before, so I don't know where it had come from. Probably come from in the block somewhere, and found itself in the inlet side of the radiator where it couldn't go any further. Because because it's not going to fit down the inside of the uh, uh, of the matrix. So here's a picture of what came out of that engine. Insert here. The next thing we started looking at um, was the thermostat. So the thermostat came out. Um, I, I had two thermostats with me, so all, no temperature gauge. So I just lobbed both thermostats in a pan of water, and we boiled the water, and, and both thermostats opened at exactly the same time. So either we got two thermostats at exactly the same fault, or both are functioning perfectly. We fucked around with the temperature sender. Um, so again, same sort of thing. We measured the resistance across it using my multimeter in a pan of boiling water. It seemed to be behaving, but I didn't have the exact figures with me. Um, distributor was the only other thing. So I'm thinking, right, okay, what's going on with this Piranha base plate? So we took the whole distributor apart. Uh, mechanical advance was all working, no problems at all. I didn't have a strobe with me, so I couldn't pull the whole distributor out of the engine. Um, and I didn't really want to start taking inlet manifolds out and looking at water pump either, because, you know, just no. Anyway, um, really, I think at that point, I was fairly convinced that the root cause with the vacuum advance was not reliable. 
So sometimes the vacuum advance would shift the optic on the base plate for the Piranha P8, Neutronic I think they used to be called, um, base plate, it would shift it sometimes and it would work. So the, 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 you know, the vacuum advance would advance the ignition at speed and it would work okay. And other times it would stick in the advanced position and other times it would stick in the closed position. So the, 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 the vacuum advance function was not right. We did our best to try and sort this out, fiddling and fucking around with it. And uh, um, yeah, I mean, all the way home, the car ran up against the red, but I thought, fuck it, I can't be after this thing anymore. And we, we were moving, it wasn't overheating, it just, the cooling system was running hot. Now there are a number of different temperature senders out there. There's one uh, with white insulation, there's one with black insulation around it. And then there's one that LD part, uh, Peter LD part sells. Um, but they've all got slightly different resistance curves against them. So depending on the temperature of the engine, it depends on how much earth it gives, depending on where the gauge reads, the mechanical uh, gauge. Try to avoid, if you possibly can, the one with the white insulation on it. Um, it comes up with the right part number, um, but I've generally found that it gives a false positive reading on the gauge uh, when it's quite high up. Now, I didn't have that sender fitted into my car at the time, but it does read as if the engine is running a lot hotter than it actually is, and then the gauge doesn't move at all. Um, so uh, that, that, that was one of the earlier kind of um, mistakes I've had. Anyway, I got the car home. It wasn't really a huge problem. It didn't overheat again. Um, I got the car all the way home and lobbed it in the garage and thought, I'm going to look at this tomorrow. So what did I find? Right, OK, rag came out again. Um, I put the mechanical gauge in. Mechanical water gauge, uh, my original mechanical water gauge, the one I'd been in the car years before, for some reason, even though the capillary bulb on the end hadn't ruptured, um, it leaked all its capillary out, um, so it wasn't doing anything at all. So I bought another one. I bought another mechanical gauge, and I thought, well, let's do a dual mechanical gauge with the um, um, oil pressure, oil pressure and a mechanical gauge. And again, with oil pressure gauges, don't watch them all the time. Just look for a behaviour and follow the pattern. Um, so... I put the mechanical gauge in there um, and drove it around and one of the things I did notice was driving around town 90 degrees all day long it would never go any hotter as soon as you get onto a motorway above two and a half thousand rpm then the temperature would start to creep now my distributor needed a rebuild so I bought a refurb distributor it came with a particularly nasty distributor cap and rotor which went back um, but otherwise it seemed okay and it came with a power spark ignition module you've all seen it well that lasted about 40 miles so i didn't bother with that anymore so i then went for the um the flamethrower and the petronics um uh, igniter system well i probably should have done it just got back to points but twin points on a stag are just a pain in the ass but i went for the petronics system because it came highly recommended and i put that in the car and you know what it did not go well it really does so i'm quite impressed with it um however the temperature gauge was still over reading so if i remember rightly um and this goes back a few years now if i remember rightly i'd be cruising around town all day long temperature gauge at 90 degrees didn't matter what the weather was okay 90 degrees thermostat opens at 82 i think on this car so behaving normally entirely normally get onto the motorway however and the gauge would start to creep up. So it would creep up to about 95 for a fair few miles, and then it would creep up to 100 for a fair few miles, and then it would creep up to 105. And then when you come to a stop, i.e. a motorway exit or a traffic jam, if you're on the M25, creep up to 110. Now my gauge maxed out 110, because uh, I got a 20 pound cap on my sealed cooling system. Um, it's uh, boiling point would have been around 125 to 130 degrees centigrade. Um, so, <sighs> It's a worry, you know, you don't really know what's going on with it. So I fiddled and fucked around with it. What is going on with this bastard cooling system? Of course, drive around town after it's running at 110 and the temperature drops down quite quickly to 90 again. So with the Petronic system in there, in this rebuilt distributor. So, oh, right, I'll go through all the different things that we did. So I bought a secret spoiler from LD Part. Very neat little bit of kit. Um, there is some science behind it. And basically the science is that there's low pressure, high pressure areas underneath the bumper, not a huge grill area. And because of that, there's not an awful lot of air that goes in the front of a stag at motorway speeds. It's got a viscous fan. 
And one of the problems with the viscous fan is that it kind of spins up to a certain speed, but then doesn't spin any faster. So you generally find that a viscous fan isn't much cop once you're doing over about 30, 35 ish miles an hour. It's great for round town driving. Go over that and kind of the, the, the ram effect of air coming through the front of the car will, will, will be more effective at cooling the car. And the fan doesn't spin at engine speed anyway. It fins, spins slightly slower. Put a secret spoiler in and the temperature dropped down to about 105 on a hot day. I mean, we were doing this testing during the summer. It was August, July, August time a few years ago. Nice weather. Pick a nice day. Right, I'm going to go and endure the traffic on the M25. So a bit of high speed running, lot of traffic, bit of high speed running, lot of traffic, bit of high. Yeah, there, there we go. So this is where it was going. And with the secret spoiler, the temperature had dropped to 105 maximum at revs. But then as soon as you slowed down, it dropped back down to 90 and it just didn't seem right. Um, and I think the normal section on a normal electric gauge is, the, you know, the kind of right in the middle is, is around somewhere between 85 and 90 degrees. When you talk about 105 degrees, you're probably up against the red sector, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong on this, on the electric gauge. Um, so <clears throat> I did a couple of other tricks um, and I'll, I'll go through those on the car, but effectively plugged up all the gaps down either side of the radiator. Um, I then found, because I took the radiator around, uh, again, to, just to double back, back flush, I found my viscous fan was fucked. Um, put a new viscous fan on, um, and that got it still about 102 degrees. Still running pretty hot, though. I mean, and it would go there quite quite quickly as well at motorway speeds. And, it, and the faster you were going, the, the more it would stay there. Not not encouraging. Went over the whole engine with my thermostat, um, with my uh, um, infrared thermostat, and just everything appears to be behaving normally. So the water was going in at a very high temperature at the top hose, coming out about 15, 20 degrees cooler at the bottom hose. Great, we're thinking. But obviously I could only test it at idle. So long and short of it all is, um, I end up plugging the um, return pipe from what's allegedly a header tank, um, and the problem went away. Completely. So I think it was a multi-part problem that I had. Um, I think that uh, the radiator inlet was bunged i think the viscous fan died in the queue for um bromley pageant and motoring i think that was a long standing problem i think that's where the sudden lurch in temperature was possibly because of that i think there was a whole load of crap steel seal whatever residue turkish delight that had found its way from the engine block and jammed itself on the inlet side of the um radiator somehow so it reduced the flow from the inlet to the outlet side of the radiator but the radiator was still efficient enough at idle speed but just at higher water volumes higher speeds it wasn't quite as efficient bunged up the gaps down the side of the radiator that made it really kind of quite quite good at controlling the temperature but ultimately um looking at the thing and i'll go over the pictures it just appeared that the header tank might be or that water pump might be able to draw coolant more easily from the header tank than it might from the bottom hose. It's a gravity feed rather than a suction feed. Um, and, you know, I just think the setup of it was was odd. So that that's the story really around why I started the calling, you know, issues I've had with it. Now, now I've bunged that return hose, I've got a high level expansion tank with a uh, low coolant level warning. And there's an entirely different set of problems with that. And I'll go into those in a second. Um, but the temperature, typically now on a motorway, it runs at 90 to 95. Um, as I come to a stop, it goes up to 100, which is what it used to be all the time before I fitted the header tank when it used to run just the standard system. So why do people fit the header tank or the high level expansion tank with low level coolant warning? Um, the Stag system as it stands, as it comes out of the factory Stag Mark II system is slightly flawed in that the expansion bottle is pressurized it's part of the pressurized circuit it's very very low down in the engine bay so let's go and have a look and i'll show you what i mean right so a bit difficult to see there's a pipe that runs along the top of the radiator here and that goes to the cold side and that pipe drops about an inch maybe two into the side tank and it comes out over here this is being chopped off uh, but normally it kind of dangles down here um, and then the expansion bottle is down there where those two brackets are, would be normally. Now, the idea is that as the system warms up, water expands, as you well know, as it, as it, as it warms up. Um, and Sorry, big sniff there. 
and it needs somewhere to expand to. So rather than just pushing its way past the expansion cap, that fella, um, it just fills the expansion bottle. And the idea is, when the engine starts to cool down again, being a sealed system, or, or um, it should suck the coolant back up from the expansion bottle down there back into the radiator. That's the idea behind it. However, there's a flaw in the water pump in that the seals on there um, do wear out. If the car's not used frequently, they will start to wear out. You end up with coolant in the V, blah de blah de blah. Um, and then you end up having to take this plug off to top the radiator up without topping because there's no point topping up at the expansion bottle. You have to top it up at the top of the system and it just becomes a ball. So I'll put this in. I put this in thinking this would be an absolutely fantastic, fantastic idea. Now, if we, let's look at the way the header tank is plumbed in on the Range Rover, first of all, because that's that's more of a typical header tank type installation. There you go, my Range Rover. Another dirty engine bay. Sorry about this, folks. Working, working environment. So, header tank. Now, two pipes onto the header tank. There's one right underneath, which you can just about see on the end of my fingertip there. And that's teed off the bottom hose. So if we go right into the engine bay, we've got the bottom hose from the radiator down here, down there. Yeah, okay, and that goes into the bottom of the water pump, which is here. There's a big T on it, which goes up to the bottom of the header tank. Then there's a bleed, which comes off the smaller pipe here, goes to the top of the cold side of the radiator. So basically your header tank is plumbed into the cold side of the radiator. All right, so if for some reason your water pump, and I don't see how it would happen, if your water pump is going to draw any coolant at all from the header tank, it's going to draw it from the cold side of the radiator, not the hot side of the radiator. Taking the air filter cover off here so you can see what's going on more effectively. Now, what we've basically got in the stag, we've got the bottom hose, comes up from the bottom hose, got this nice little metal tube in the middle of it, and it goes into the water pump, which is here. Now, one of the challenges of the stag is that the water pump is quite high up in the block and the radiator is quite low down because the car's got a low nose. Um, and it is one of the challenges that if the coolant drops too much, then uh, the, the, the water pump will run dry. This little stub off here is the heater pipe. It's normally a U-shaped pipe. It goes like that into the heater rail, which is over there somewhere. So normally, um, the water pump will draw water either from the heater pipe or from, more, more, more probably, from the bottom hose. Okay, and suck it through. And then it comes back out the top hose, back into the radiator. So the water pump will only ever draw coolant from the cold side of the radiator. This little blue bit here is a T-piece that is put in, and this is the way that this um, tank is, is, is plumbed in. So basically on the tank here, we've got the bottom feed, we've got the top feed, um, and we've got an overflow pipe here. It's just the overflow bit, don't worry about that. It's just to stop the overflow from pouring out over my alternator, which is not in a standard position, but it's up there. So when the water pump's drawing, there is a possibility that it could find it easier to draw from this pipe than that pipe and then the, the, the header tank would then because it ha won't have a vacuum because it's then taking a feed from the cooling system here so this is the hot pipe that's the cold pipe it's the hot pipe that goes into the radiator that way that pipe comes this way yeah so the idea now is that this water pump is sucking because it's, ro it's rotating is it going to suck water from the bottom of the radiator down there or is it going to suck it through this pipe here that way uh, and then it'd be replenished by this little top hose, which is teed into the top hose here. Now, that's what I think was happening. That is exactly what I think was happening. Now, this filter, this all this lot was supplied at the same time, this, this little bungy thing here. So what I've effectively got here now is I've put a, another Jubilee clip. And there's there's a, a lump of threaded rod in there or a bolt or something that I've just clamped in just to block the feed. And that's all I did. And that's all I had to do to drop the cooling uh, system uh, by... 10 to 15 degrees when running at speed. <sighs> Bastard thing. So at the moment, this thing is behaving itself, um, although the light is a constant pest. Um, I might as well not have the low level warning on it because, you know, an early warning system with a 10 second delay on it is no use to man nor beast. Uh, so that's that really. Um, I need to get another tank. Uh, I, I've got this one here which I was going to use, but I've just noticed it's a bit of a disaster with it. So this is a tank out of an XR4i. Uh, it's see-through, which I quite, kind of quite like, but then I've just noticed that there's a split along there. That's been bashed on something. 
Now, I've had this for years, this thing. I don't even know where I got it from. But that's not helpful, that there. That's a weak point. These things are often, they're bonded, and they do they do have weak points. But I'm going to find something else very similar to that and uh, see if I can uh, utilise that. But the, the, the nice thing about this, I, I still wouldn't use it as a header tank. I would still use it as an expansion tank. Now, in theory, I could, if I have the right one, mount it over here, thus... I'd actually have it off the bottom hose. But this one, with the brackets I've got on it, was actually designed to go here. Which, you know, looks quite smart. Beside my Malpassi Filter King. Ignore all the crap up here. I do need to give this engine bay a clean. But it's an engine bay for crying out loud. Um, I'll get rid of that T-piece there. Because the expansion tank would need, need, needs to feed into the correct location it's an expansion tank not a high level header tank it's, it's, I'm, I'm just i'm not not going to push that anymore but that's